comes to African Americans specifically is this piece around being in the United States. I feel like white supremacy and patriarchy are going. But here in the United States and the way it looks on African American families is kind of like the oppression and those internalized isms mm -hmm. that kind of play a role in the violence that occurs along with being low income. Because that's the focus with this particular one. I'll be curious about middle class, upper middle class families, that's low income families. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the thing that I see. Okay. And so, um, this is some of the, I just wanted to share some of the um, quotes that some of the participants in my study had with regards to their experiences, because everything that you all said was absolutely right. All of them said some piece of the things that you had mentioned. So with the experience of when it's like intimate partner violence, I did uh, qualitative data analysis. So within that, you generate themes and you find the dominant things that people discuss throughout the um, data. And so with the experience of actually witnessing intimate partner violence, one of the main things was the loss of safety. At a very young age, they lost that naivety, if you want to call it. Um, and they, at that point, everything was like, like you're saying, like hypervigilant. And so the thing, trauma literally transforms the brain. So when you say fight or flight, there's an increased level of cortisol that gets released. But when it keeps happening over and over again, it's there all the time. So it's hard for them to distinguish when I'm safe, when I'm not safe. So it's kind of this always hypervigilance, always on alert. So one of the things, one of the participants, I'll just read it out, is um, dealing with seeing our mom get hit was a whole other thing. We didn't want to go come home sometimes. We felt safe at our grandmother's house. She lived right up the street from us, and she was in a poor neighborhood as well, but we felt safe with her. So it was just this constant feeling of, I want to escape, I want to get out of here. I feel helpless. It's this one helplessness and this one voicelessness that comes as a result. So oftentimes, kids are placed in the middle of those situations. Um, so active and passive reactions, which I kind of spoke to, um, they felt helpless. Like, once I'm so young, I'm so little, what more can I do? Um, and they try to ask them, try to make sense out of it, like, why is this happening? And basically, their female mother, female caregiver or mother would tell them, well, he's not going to do it anymore. You know, and so for them, it's just this continued cycle, and then everyone in the home is on edge. So it's not just mom that's timid, it's also the children. They don't want to make, and I'm privileging male to female intimate partner violence, just to put that out there. But um, that they all kind of share the same experience as the victim. So when the perpetrator was around, everybody was kind of scary, ambivalent, um, with the hopes of not wanting to trigger any type of physical violence. So the, um, <clears throat> what happens in the house stays in the house simply. Mm -hmm. you know, we mm -hmm. can't talk about that outside of nobody, mm -hmm. so it has to be that secret that we hold on to. Yeah, it becomes hidden, yeah. very yeah. hidden. And it's kind of perpetuated even in the family. Sometimes it's like, oh, well, you know, it's not that serious or minimizing it. Yeah. And so it makes it all the more invalidating. I, I know this is male, uh, male, female. Is it, do you know if any research going on right now about same female. sex? Oh, it is some coming out, but there, yeah, there needs there needs to be more research on it. It's underdeveloped right now, so there definitely needs to be more research on, you know, same sex couples because there is a lot um, that needs to be worked on. It's not little. It's not much at all. And I'd like to say also, what happens to the child in the womb? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked about how fight or flight and cortisol mm -hmm. and it becomes a generational yes, thing when it's yeah. in your body mm -hmm. and that child marinates in that womb yeah. Yeah. and then black men wind up into the wild women black men say you know black women are so aggressive you know because i think a lot of times these things do make you a little bit more aggressive mm -hmm. it does it does you know and even saying? inside like you said even in the womb they are impacted biochemically because of that, like you said, high cortisol level stress, yes. And, and to piggyback on that, the studies say that women who deal with high levels of stress while they're pregnant, well, uh, stress and depression uh, affects the amygdala, and it mm -hmm. especially yep. Yep. deals with the male children, mm -hmm. making them more hypervigilant yep. Yep. and um, mm -hmm. in that kind of fight or flight mode. Mm -hmm. So when you see boys in the hood, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're already predisposed yep. to that kind of energy and, mm -hmm. and uh, respond, well, mm -hmm. not even responding, acting. Yep. Um, initially, so it does affect the child. It does, and the amygdala grows. Yeah. When you keep getting exposed to trauma, it, it gets bigger, because that's responsible for the fight or flight. So it grows, it's like, oh, I need to produce more, so I need to grow more. 
So usually they have much bigger. Where's the amygdala? I'm not sure about the exact position, but yeah, it would be towards so, that. So there's that uh, perpetual fear again that I'm not safe in the house, mm -hmm. I'm not safe in the streets. Yep. So it's always on it's the always, always on the always, always, right? yeah. always, everywhere you go. But if that's the case, it's affecting all of us on a very mag yep. large scale because exactly. we see that every day, especially with all this. Mm -hmm. It's complex yeah. trauma. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And a generational transmission of trauma mm -hmm. and violence. Mm -hmm. And it becomes embedded. Take it in. Okay. Um, the impact on self-identity and development, uh, the loss of childhood and gay independence. A lot of the participants said they had to grow up very fast. Mm -hmm. Feel like they didn't have a childhood. They were often a protector of one, um, participant talked about how she was the protector of her mom. She had to push her dad off of her mom. She took a risk, she was scared, but she said she didn't have a choice. Yeah. She felt like he was gonna kill her had she not done that. Um, so, you know, one person said, you know, you feel like you really do have to grow up too fast with that going around because you feel like you have more responsibility. One kid said that his mom was back and forth with his dad, left him and his younger brother to fit themselves. So he had to drop out of school to take care of his younger brother to make sure he was okay. So it's just those things, the relationship impacts them. Um, and adolescent problems. Um, and what I found, which was interesting, I had six females and four males. All six, with the exception of one, all five of the females stated that they perpetuated violence in their relationship because they didn't want to be the victim. So one of my uh, female she was like, I'd rather be the one punching the guy in his mouth as opposed to me being in the corner somewhere being weak. So for her, she was like, I'm not gonna be the way my mom was. So a lot of females in the study um, were that way. There was one male who kind of, I guess, justified the violence. He, he said, you know, his girlfriend said something uh, rude to him. He slapped her in the mouth. He said she didn't ever say it again. He never had popped her in the mouth again. So for him, it was just like, it was what it was. You know, but he witnessed it as well. When his mom, his little sister, he was 10 years old and his sister was 17 and they had to, beat her boyfriend down with a bat because she walked in the room with the teeth on, you know, her teeth knocked out. So it was just those things. And he said, if it wasn't for those things, maybe that wouldn't, he wouldn't have been so apt to respond that way when his girlfriend insulted him. He didn't tell me what she said either. I was curious, but he said it just didn't happen again. On the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. we kind of downplay the fact that women are violent towards men you know, right. most of the time men won't report it yep. because it's, it's embarrassing, mm -hmm. humiliating to go to the police station and say, I got beat up by my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the issue. it's not reported. So I think that the scale of that is larger than it might present itself to be. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right about that because it is often minimized. It's made sometimes as a joke or a mockery. Mm -hmm. You know, people tend to laugh at that, yeah. you know, when it isn't funny. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's it needs to be, once I just did an interview a couple weeks ago saying that that does need to be highlighted because it does happen. Mm -hmm. um, women are, you know, they're affected. They have more injuries, severe yeah. injuries, and they're more likely to be murdered. Mm -hmm. However, men also have injuries and can get murdered as well mm -hmm. in those relationships. Mm -hmm. um, the low income piece. So I kind of looked at every section and tried to weave it together. Very difficult um, to kind of make sure I captured every experience, every nuance of mm -hmm. being black, being low income, witnessing uh, domestic violence and understanding how it impacted their self-identity and development. So the experience of being a low income youth, one of the participants was talking about her frustration. Just basically saying, you know, me and understand that she said from white people that they need to understand where they're coming from. So it's in letting them know, like, we don't want to be in this. This is not something that we are saying, hey, you know, we want to be in this type of situation, this environment. So said so no one wants to hear gunshots right down the street or almost right outside your door. People don't want to live in that environment. That makes you that makes you angry, like you get sick and tired of it. It's only but so much you can take. So I think with those frustrations of the community and just the area as a whole, I mean, you're not happy. You're not a happy person. No one wants to live in a city that's full of violence, crime, and drugs. So it's just kind of like, is that plus the violence in the home? And this particular participant, her mom was also um, a substance abuser. And her father, her stepdad would beat her mom up when she come home high because they didn't have the money, low income. So it was just all these things as opposed to, oh, he's just an abuser. It's other context in there. It doesn't justify it, but it helps you get more understanding. Uh, the impact on the community is this piece where, you know, one kid told me, 
Um, well, he's an adult, but as a kid, he said college wasn't an option for him. He said the drug dealer was an option. He said, you know, I can go right to the drug mm -hmm. dealer um, and be a, he said, an ace one, A1 drug dealer or something mm -hmm. like that. He said it was easy, which he became. Now he had a job at the time, but when he was younger, he was like, I didn't have that option like other kids had who are in more wealthier neighborhoods or middle class, upper middle class neighborhoods. Um, so, and that's hence, it makes it difficult. So like I said earlier, the youth, they're oftentimes in this place of, all I have is this one option. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have any other option. Uh, experience of being African American, I was, the thing you find with research, I wanted a certain answer and I was getting frustrated because I wasn't. <laughs> so they couldn't really speak to their experience until I put it out there. It was like, mm, you know, for them it was more subtle. So these were the few that actually had some uh, feedback about their experience. You know, when my dissertation committee members, she was like, well, maybe they were answering the question mm -hmm. by not knowing, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so one of the things is one of uh, particular participants said, he was just talking about the racial inequalities. They allowed them to talk about that when they did. Um, so one guy says, from the time that the country was made, white people could own land, white people could have jobs and could educate their children. Black people couldn't, therefore they had a head start in that aspect. So it would be more wealthy white people or more white people with a chance to be wealthy than it is black because they've been doing it since the beginning of time. So they recognize there is this, this lack, still trying to catch up, still trying to catch up. Um, but at the same time, it's still like this, I guess this hidden thing where they don't really understand, like it's a, so much internalization mm -hmm. that sometimes is blinded, don't even see it. It's like having a veil over your eyes. It's like, oh, I didn't even realize that was a problem. Like one, another participant was saying about um, being poor and recognizing the difference when they got older, but she said it was fun poor. She was like, I just thought that was life. I didn't know there was something wrong with that. You know, and so until they got older, that's when they started noticing little things um, little, maybe some microaggressions, you know, in regards to um, subtleties, like maybe people following them around in the store, but it wasn't until it got highlighted that it was like, oh, that's what that was. It's kind of putting words to their experience. So a lot of times people can't really articulate those things. And the last one is the strength piece, which they, most of them did highlight, like it made me stronger as a result. Um, and saying that they have a tough skin because of the environment they grew up in, like I was saying earlier, kind of get desensitized, things become normalized, so you kind of tough. Um, and it's hard to get into that into that center. Um, because like I said, for a lot of them, what they learn at an early age is that vulnerability, closeness, intimacy equals hurt and pain. So it is about reframing that for them. But until they have experiences that tell them different, they continue to have that type of mindset. And it's the piece around resiliency, but I've come, I've, uh, found a new um, term that I now like to use called post-traumatic growth. Um, so basically, you know, resiliency is I am strong in spite of it. Like this happened to me, I'm still strong, I'm pushing through, but post-traumatic growth is I'm strong because of this. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Yeah. You know what I mean? So like that didn't happen, I wouldn't even got stronger. Yeah, I was ripped to pieces, yeah, I was shattered, but now I'm stronger and the rug being pulled from under me is a little bit harder now than it was before. And so that's the piece that I wanted to look more into as opposed to resiliency is great too, but it, I feel like as a people, I believe we're in this post-traumatic growth state. So just trying to weave through that and, and really work through those things.